Do you have solo economic dependency? That is, if you aren't working, you aren't making money. The Art of Passive Income Podcast is the solution. Discover passive income models so you can enjoy life on your own terms. Let freedom ring. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, your favorite land geek. And I just wanted to introduce for the next three weeks, the best of roundtable podcasts for 2020 as the land geeks uh, take off and wind down uh, as we head into 2021. And this podcast with Drew Karanowicz is really inspirational if you haven't heard it yet, where he takes his hobby to a $15 million net worth, how he builds up to 25,000 a month in passive income just by using the investor's toolkit and focusing. So it's amazing. Um, if you've already heard it, I think it's worth a second listen. And with that being said, hope everyone out there is not too stressed out while you do your Hanukkah shopping and enjoy this best of podcast. And on this week's roundtable, we are going to get to grill a geek, a old school OG land geek from about four years ago. But before we talk to our land geek and what he has been able to accomplish in the past four years with only the toolkit, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce our round table land geeks. Let's just start with the technician, Eric Peterson. Eric, how are you? I'm good. Good. Good to see you. Um, and of course, we've got the terrorist hunter, the most feared woman in the country, Mimi Schmidt. Mimi, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Mark? Glad I'm great. You. Yeah. Uh, we've got the nightcap OG dude buddy, Scott Bossman. Scott, how are you? I'm hanging in there, Mark. How about you? Yeah. Look, I'm staying positive. There's no panic here. It's all good. It's all good. You know? Look, uh, you know, this too shall pass, like everything else. So, I'm not panicking. But uh, the person I know is definitely not panicking. He's probably enjoying it. I love it when you call me Big Papa, times two now, with the newborn, Tate Litchfield. Tate, how are you? I'm good, yeah. Cool as a cucumber. I, you know, every time I look at you and I don't see those dark circles under your eyes, I'm so jealous. Yeah, man. How is that possible, man? It's, it's called work when you want and work if you want. And re- really? lately, I've been doing a lot of the if you want. You know, just kind of enjoying, yeah. fam- enjoying, just enjoying the family time, right? Don't really feel like working a ton. There you go. Eric Peterson, the bigger papa. Big, I love that. The bigger papa now. He's not just Tate? the big papa. He's the bigger papa. He's the bigger papa. That's right. Um, and then, of course, last but not least, the brain, the professor, the flight school Sherpa, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist, your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Learn anything about anything. Investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. So our guest today is Drew Kranovich. Drew, welcome. Hey, Mark. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So, Drew, um, let's just skip the pleasantries. How did you f- just find Land Geek and kind of give us a little bit of your background? Sure. So um, probably like a lot of the, the people who found Land Geek, I was a podcast junkie, came across the business through a podcast, um, quickly kind of immersed myself into it, started educating myself. Took me about two weeks from the time that I first um, listened to the podcast and became introduced to the business till till I invested in the toolkit. I invested in the toolkit late, late 2015, early 2016. It was basically the beginning of 2016 that I started. and just dove right into the toolkit and the education. There was no flight school. Um, I didn't do any of the coaching or anything like that back then. I attended a couple of boot camps early on, but um, yeah, I just hopped right in. Um, at the time, I had a pretty demanding 
uh, day job. I was traveling almost every week of the year, um, high stress, high intensity consulting gig. And um, I knew that at some point in my life, I didn't want to, you know, do that forever, especially when it came time to have a family. So I just put my head down, started working on the business. It took me four years. Um, I don't know that it needed to take me four years, but I didn't want my lifestyle to change. So it took me four years. And um, back in November of just this past year, my wife and I welcomed our, our first son to the family. And I was able to quit my job when the day he was born. So uh, ne didn't necessarily plan it to happen that way, but, but it did and it really couldn't have been couldn't have been any better for me. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And, um, you know, being one of those papas and Tate's one of those as well, that, you know, life is very different when you are able to work from home with your, your baby. Um, yeah. and, uh, of course the jury's still out for me if it's a good or bad thing for my kids, but you know, selfishly, it's, it's been uh, amazing. And, and for you to be able to, to do that is phenomenal. I know that everyone listening is going to want to know, you know, if we don't, if you don't mind me asking, what are, what's your passive? Like, what are the numbers? How long did it sure. take you to sort of replace that income? Sure. And I'll just say real quick, um, gosh, I feel blessed to, to have been able to work from home when my son was born. It is a so much more work than I ever anticipated and my wife stays at home and it's still so much more work. So I couldn't imagine having a day job and trying to raise a son at the same time. So um, it's been awesome. But to answer your question, um, like I said, I've been at it for four years. Today, my passive is at about 25,000 a month. Um, it didn't start super fast. The first two years were kind of slow. I think the first year I was doing about a deal, maybe two a month. Um, the second year I was probably doing between two and four deals a month. I had periods of time where, where my day job got, was busier than others, which slowed me down a bit, even though I never stopped. And it wasn't until the beginning of year three, I really looked myself in the mirror and I said, am I going to continue to just do this as a hobby or did I actually want to create a legitimate business for myself and make a lot of money and, and get myself in a position to quit my job? And year three is when I really put goals in place to, um, to really get there. I think my goal for year three was to be at about 7,500 by the end of the year. Um, and I hit that goal. I was right around 7,500, maybe a tad bit more. And then my fourth year, this, this past year that just ended 2019, my goal was to hit um, 15,000, was to double that to 15,000. And I, hit, uh, I actually hit 20,000 by November when my son was born. So uh, summer last year was really good to me. And um, so here I am. And then since then I've been continuing on and I'm at 25 now and um, continuing to just scale the business. Yeah, that's amazing. It kind of reminds me of that, you know, that Zig Ziglar quote I always love to quote, if you'll do for the next three to five years what other people won't do, you'll be able to do for the rest of your life what other people can't do. And Scott Todd at 25,000 a month, what's Drew's net worth? How much would he need to save in the bank at 2% interest today to, to well, make 300,000 a year? Okay. So the, the way the story goes is uh, I went into chase a few, I don't know, a few months ago now and I walked into chase and on the TV screens behind the cashiers, it said, Hey, we'll pay you 2% for 20 months. So, you know, I think if, if Drew went down to Chase and he's like, hey, listen, and this is old numbers, I'm sure, but if he went down there and said, hey, listen, uh, I want to, I want to, I want you to give me $25,000 in interest every month. Well, they'd say, okay, no problem, Drew. They'd bring out the calculator and they'd say, okay, 25,000 times 12, well, that's 300,000 a year uh, divided by 0 0.02. So, Drew, you write us a check right now. For fifteen million dollars, and then we'll send you two hundred uh, twenty-five thousand dollars a month. Well, Drew, Drew would have to break out a check for fifteen million dollars if he wanted to produce that same thing in in uh, in the bank. I mean, you know, when the stock market was flying high, I mean, maybe he would have earned eight percent or ten percent. The number would have been lower. But now, where it, where the stock market has like wiped away a third of its value in what, like three weeks? 
uh, that's a big neg negative. So uh, I don't even know how to calculate that. So let's just say, I don't know, 15 million. How's that? How does it feel to be uh, having a net worth of $15 million? <laughs> Feels pretty good. I, uh, I'm glad I found land and I didn't get stuck investing in stocks or some other crazy, uh, crazy type of, type of way that uh, I would have been in a lot worse position right now for sure. Well, I think it'd be really fun for all of us to sort of ask you some questions and unpack, you know, your success secrets so that we can all replicate it. So let's just start with the dude, buddy, the nightcap OG, Scott Bossman. Scott, what's your first question for Drew? Hey, Drew, nice talking to you. Um, yeah, I, I got into the business a little bit before you. I was a toolkit guy to start, and uh, I would just say, you know, it's not easy. So what recommendations would you have for people out there who have the toolkit? Uh, because it's, it's not a, it's, it's kind of a jigsaw puzzle, right? You have to put this thing together all by yourself. So how did you do that? And like, what other, did you use other resources or um, give, give some advice for people out there who have the, the investor toolkit? Yeah. So my, my answer would be pretty simple. Um, follow the process. I did not, do anything revolutionary. I hit singles all day with these land deals. I followed the process in the toolkit. I didn't go off and, and left field and try to create my own special processes. Whatever Mark and whatever the group taught, I followed it. Of course, I've put my own spin on, on some things now, but for the most part, I, I executed the business exactly how it was um, you know, designed. And a uh, couple of things, to the, the quote Mark gave about, you know, if you do for the next three to five years what others won't do. I thought about that all the time. So I just put my head down and worked for three to five years. Um, this business is a mental game more than anything. I mean, it, it's still mentally draining for me today. I mean, even with all the success I've had, I still, at the beginning of every month, I'm in, in the, you know, the starts back at zero property sold this month, it can be overwhelming. So there's the mental aspect to it. The other thing I'll tell you, and this is, this is serious. Uh, I have a note on my a little sticky note on my desk and it has Scott Todd's name on it. And Scott, I apologize if I get this number wrong. This was a couple of years ago. You had said that you did 280, I think it was 280 deals in a year. And my number might be slightly off. Um, or maybe you're on pace to do 280. Doesn't matter. And note, is still on my desk today. And, and I kind of just said, Hey, look, if Scott can do it and, and Scott's a super sharp and talented guy, but we can all do this. So I just look at that note when I need some motivation, other people are doing it. Why not me? Yeah. You know, uh, Scott. Yeah. Mark, I will tell you like that, that is in fact, one of the things I think um, kind of got me through it, right? Like through those hard days, uh, especially in the beginning and like, I don't mean any offense to anybody, but like nobody has special skills or talents. Like, uh, like, you know, like we, we're all, we all have the same opportunity. We all have the same uh, ability to learn. Now it might take someone a little bit longer to learn. It might, someone might pick it up a little bit faster, but if you keep, if you just keep trying to learn, you can literally learn anything but you got, you got to be prepared for the bumps, right? Like you got to be prepared for the, the hard landing. Sometimes you got to be prepared for, you know, that, that discomfort that you'll get when you're doing something new, but like literally like Drew said, like, I'm not necessarily special for this business. You're not special. Anybody on this call is not special. If, if we can all do it, everybody can do it. The difference is like literally as we used to say on this call, embrace the suck. You're going to be bad at it. Okay. It's going to be weird. And we don't like as humans, we don't like being bad at things, especially when you're accustomed to succeeding at things. Yeah, no, I love, I love the fact that he brought up the mental game uh, for sure. And Scott, to your point, I, I agree with you. I, my mom wouldn't, she would tell you she thinks I'm special, but otherwise hundred percent. And Eric Peterson's mom would say the same thing about him. Oh, yeah, I think everybody's yeah. special in their own way, right? That's right. That's right. But as far as from a business standpoint, you know, we all had to start somewhere. And, you know, Scott's right. What's nice about flight school and coaching is we smart cut that process. And, 
you know, you don't have to sort of figure it out on your own now. But what's nice about Drew's story is that, the, you know, the moral of that story is if you just keep doing it systematically, 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 at some point in that timeline, you will be paid handsomely. Uh, and you will get your passive to exceed your fixed expenses and then quit your job and stay home with the kids, which leads us to our next land geek. Mimi Schmidt, let's, let's put Drew on the grill. See how, uh, like see how he know. sizzles. So more about the mind game, right? In that third year, you were starting to churn and do really well. How did you kick it up? How did you scale it to that next level? What did you have to talk yourself into? Did you have to find more money? What were your hard spots? How did you, how did you scale it? Um, the simple answer is how I scaled it was I put more mail out there. I reverse engineered it. I said, Hey, look, I want to do X number of deals a year. That equates to X number of month. I know what my close rate is. I know how many pieces of mail I have to put out. And I did that and I executed that flawlessly. And I told myself I will figure it out when the phone rings. Um, from a, of course, now I did have to start hiring on additional support. You know, I kind of, I wasn't early on doing a ton with VAs. So, you know, I, I started having VAs help me out here and there um, for sure. From a financial standpoint, I was okay because my day job more than gave us enough for what we needed to live off of my family and every dollar for the first four years in this business got reinvested back into the business. Um, so from that standpoint, you know, I had to pull from places from time to time to, to keep the, keep the, the deal flow funds going. But for the most part, I just said, I reverse engineered it. How much mail do I have to put out a month to reach my goals? And I put that mail out and I figured the rest out along the way. I'm kind of one of those guys that, you know, I don't act, um, you know, I don't, I don't just move too quick, but to some degree, you just kind of have to do it and see what happens. You can't overthink things. Just, just go out there and do it and you'll figure it out. It's awesome. Love it. I love it. The, the Nike mentality. Just do it. Yeah. Is it Nike or Nike? It's Nike, right? Yeah, it's Nike. Yeah. So. Nike. Nike. Yeah. I always forget about that. Eric Peterson, what question do you have for Drew? Yeah, Drew. So um, let's see. I think if I, if I heard this correctly, for the first three years, basically you had a full-time job you did the land business on the side. Is that correct? Four years. All, okay, all four, four years. years. I didn't quit to my fourth year. Yep. Okay, cool. So for, you know, a lot of people getting started in this business, they still have a full-time job. They're out there, you know, doing that and trying to do this at nights or on the weekends, what have you. What advice do you have for someone like that um, that's out there trying to make this successful with limited time, you know, from your experience, what, what would you say to them? Um, I mean, I would say limited time is, is only in your mind. Um, if you want to do something, you're going to make time. We all have time. I, I would argue that I had a, as demanding and stressful a job as, as, as anybody. I mean, of course, some people have probably more stressful jobs than me, but mine was pretty stressful. And if I could have done it, a lot of people can do it. And maybe, maybe some people don't have the stress, but maybe that's replaced with having a family and kids. At the, rea at the end of the day, the reality is you got to make sacrifices. And, um, you know, my wife was on board and your family has to be on board. I, I won't lie. I worked every day. I was doing something. I'm not saying I, I was working around the clock, but every day I was doing something. And, and if you want more specific, I was probably putting about 20 hours a week into the land business. Um, in, in recent memory, I don't remember what it was like in the first couple of years, but the last couple of years, it was about 20 hours a week in addition to, to my day job. And so you just gotta, you just gotta make a commitment. I mean, like I just keep going back to saying, you've got to make a sacrifice for three to five years to change things for the rest of your life. And it's, there's no easy way around that sometimes. Fantastic. Tate, you want to, you want to put them on the grill? Yeah, well, Drew, congratulations. I mean, achieving what you achieved, it's the best feeling ever. So my hat goes off to you and, you know, here's to 
many, many more deals and huge success. But one thing that I'd like to know is, um, obviously, you've been in this business for four years now. Um, now you're into it kind of full time, all of your commitment, this is all you do. Um, how many different counties did you look at before you finally found the one that spoke to you? Oh, gosh. Um, it didn't take long to settle in to the top two to four counties that I've worked the majority of my career in. Mm -hmm. I probably put mail out to 15 or 20 counties that I would never touch again. Um, now, early on, I mean, I was, I, I might've put a couple hundred offers here and a couple hundred there. And looking back on it, I, I probably, I, I may not have had the pricing right, or it just wasn't a large enough sample size to dial it in. Um, it took me some time, but pretty quickly I, I found my way into, to my counties. And, um, again, nothing revolutionary for me. I went where everyone else was going. I looked where yeah. you went, where Scott went, where Mark went. I just followed the, the blueprint. I wasn't trying to go off and create my own path because if it worked for you guys, why not me? Um, so that's kind of how I started. And then like everybody else, I found my way into the two or three counties I work today. It, it's, yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, I hear this from people a lot, just, Hey, you know, the first County I mailed to, I got a response, but it, I just didn't connect to it. Is it okay if I move on? And it's like, sure. You know, at some point you're going to have to sell this stuff. And so if you don't like it, if you don't care about it, if you can't see value in it, you know, it's okay to try somewhere else. And I think it takes a little bit of time. And so to hear that you mailed to, you know, a dozen or more counties until you found the ones that you really connected with is probably going to be motivating to a lot of people. Cause I know there's somebody out there listening to this call that is going to say, I'm going to mail out 500 offers to this County. If it doesn't work out, I quit. And obviously your advice is the exact opposite of that. Try another one, try again, try again, try again. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get to Scott Todd, since Mike's not on the call, and I love to impersonate Mike. I just thought I would be Mike. Oh, and, no, uh, don't do that. You're going to kill the call, man. <laughs> I know. We're on a high right now, Mark. We're even, on a high. Even Eric Peterson is cringing right now. <laughs> really? I thought it, I thought it was a, a, a huge, like, fan favorite when Mark does Mike. Eric, you're the, you're the judge here. What do you say? We got to let him do it. Uh, Come on. We know how bad it is, but <laughs> we just, you, you come to expect it. Here, here goes the ratings. <laughs> All right. So, Scott, we're, we, I can't even pronounce where Mike, Mike is right now. He's in Kuta. Punta Cana, right? Punta Cana. Punta Cana. Punta Cana. Punta Cana, yeah. Hopefully he'll be able to get home. But who knows? We'll see. He'll be right. So, uh, Drew, as Mike Zeno, first of all, Drew, I just want to say congratulations. <laughs> and uh, I just want to know, if you were going to start again, what would you have done differently? Uh, <laughs> and um, I just want to thank Scott Todd for not dropping off the call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if... You know, I, I don't have many regrets looking back on it. The only thing I would have maybe done differently is, um, obviously, I wish I would have got there faster. Um, I feel like I kind of spun my wheels a little bit the first two years. So whether that was, you know, but I feel like a little bit, there's a part at the beginning where you just can't go too fast because you got to feel your way into the business. Um, I, I would have definitely liked to move faster at the beginning. Um, I would have set more specific goals to for acquisitions and sales at the beginning and um you know potentially hey i mean you know flight school wasn't around when i was there um that would be very appealing to me today um knowing that you're being pushed into the business a little bit faster i mean for me it was literally self-learning toolkit and you know i came to a couple of boot camps but but outside of that i was kind of on my own to to self-motivate myself so um, probably would have looked for ways to to motivate myself and and, and get there faster. Um, 
if I can do it differently. Ooh, that's a great answer. You're a star. <laughs> You're a star. Thanks, Mike. You're welcome. All right, Scott Todd. Um, what question do you have for Drew? Well, you took my question. So, uh, I mean, I mean, you know. And, and that's why I did, by the way, that's why I did that. No, you I notice how we it. all get our important questions out first, and then you're always the last one to get to ask. I just keep scratching. Put the most pressure on you. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah. It's all right. All right. So, look, Drew, uh, like everybody said, congratulations. I mean, you, you keep, you kept plowing away, right? Like, you just kept chiseling away. And one of the things that uh, I see a lot from people is that they, they want results now, right? Like we live in an instant gratification society. Take kind of hit on it. I'm going to mail 500 of these things. And if they don't come back, I'm going to quit. That's it. One shot. But the other thing that I notice is that sometimes people, when they get a little bit of success early on, what they want to do is they want to blow the thing up, right? They want to scale. Everybody loves the word scale. I want to scale my business and I want this thing. Forget the fact that it took Drew three years or four years and forget how long it took Mimi and forget how long it took Scott Bossman. I want to do this thing in six months. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down to the bank and I'm going to borrow off my home equity loan or whatever amount of credit I can get and I'm going to like be the baller. I'm going to own the market. So my question to you is how much bank financing did you take or what other alternative investments or alternative financing sources did you look at to scale your business? Yeah. So um, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Um, the scaling part has been the, the one thing that it's been probably the most challenging and, and also the most exciting. Um, I'm a numbers guy, so I map everything out on a spreadsheet and I look at it and, you know, the reality is if you're doing, you know, I do 75% of my deals on terms, right? My terms deal on average takes 12 months to get my return. Um, if you just map out the math and map out how many deals you want to do, you're quickly going to realize that you don't make, the money doesn't come back as quickly as it needs to go out, especially if you're always in a, in a, in a scale type phase in your business. Um, so I, I had to really think about that and how I wanted to do that. And, um, I, I knew I didn't want to be over leveraged. Um, I knew that the last time the, the downturn hit, you know, people who were over leveraged got crushed. Um, and I knew something was, was coming sooner than later, obviously didn't know things were going to happen the way that they did now, but I just wanted to, personally, I didn't want to be over leveraged. Um, so I, I have taken a little bit of, uh, of financing and I, I'll tell you the different ways that I fund deals with today. Number one, I've got my own personal business and, and the cash flow that that generates goes back out to buy deals. Number two, Scott, I've sold you um, a handful of, of portions of notes, 12 months of notes to generate some cash flow for deals. Um, three, I've taken some small loans against my business. Um, very small, um, nothing overly significant. I would say that I'm about 10% leveraged right now against my passive income. Um, I've got a QRP, which I funnel deals through. Um, I can take a loan against that QRP. I haven't done that yet, but at some point I will, probably when the market stabilizes. So that's another source of, of potential capital. And then the last one, and one that I just actually started doing, um, I've got connected with a partner and we started a new entity and it's, it's a pretty classic 50, 50 split. He funds everything. I do all the work. We split profits 50, 50. And right now with the state of the economy, I'm probably going to look to funnel most of my deals through this company. Sure. I'm going to give up half the profits, but I'm also not going to funnel my own capital into deals as much right now. And, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's how I'm doing it. So if you want to scale, you certainly have to get creative, but I'm definitely, um, I'm, I'm happy looking back on it that I didn't become over leveraged or didn't try to scale too fast. You, you can't move too fast. You know, no great business is built overnight. It's just, that's just not how things work. You've got to, you've got to be very, you know, um, methodical about the way that you approach the business. So, so that's how I've done it. Perfect. Thank you.
Great, great. I know, Drew, everybody wants to ask this question, which is besides Mac or PC, which we'll get to, what are your fixed expenses? Um, to, to run the business? To run the business. Uh, are you counting, are you counting deal flow or, or are you counting like acquisition costs for property? No, cause that's variable. Okay. Um, just your fixed so, expenses. Gosh, three or four grand a month, four grand a month. Three or four grand. Okay. You know, mail that, is included in that. Mail is included. Okay. Of, I, I, you know, I don't have a ton of expenses. I mean, obviously there's the mail piece. I try to mail three to 4,000. Let's see. I don't really count month. mail as an expense. That's just an, that's an investment that you get an ROI on that. So if we take away the mailings, just Gosh. the expenses of running the business, VAs, software. Um, Gosh, it's, it's so insignificant that I don't actually like, I mean, I'll look at my, my income statement from time to time, $1,500 a month, maybe. I mean, it's not, it's not overly significant. Yeah. Tate, does that seem in line to you? I think yeah. that's about average. I mean, you yeah. know, we work from home. There's no rent. Um, yeah. VAs are inexpensive. VAs are cheap. Internet's inexpensive. There might be a few tools that he's using out there, some subscriptions, but even then, I mean, I've got a lot of softwares that I pay for and it's like a couple hundred bucks a month. So yeah. not, not terrible. I, I don't know. When I hear some people talk about their fixed expenses being, you know, 50% of their income, it's like, what are you doing? How many people do you have working for you, right? Like, do you have full-time employees? That's crazy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, Drew, this has been really fantastic. Um, I, I didn't hear, did you mention Mac or PC? PC, for sure. Okay. Any, any good person, any good analytical person, Mark's going to have a PC. I mean, w yeah. we, we've we proven that. I don't know why you keep harping on this thing. Not even, yeah, it's, not, it's, even it's not a problem. It, yeah, no, I, I, I think that, um, you know, the Mac people have taken a hit this podcast, which is why we edit so, so diligently at this point in the podcast you, you where out that our guest uses a PC. See, I'm just going to keep harping on this. So you're going to have to do a lot of editing. You'll give up. We're going to edit out all of Scott Todd is what we're going to do. PC, PC. <laughs> so, so before we get to the tip of the week, Drew, which we're going to uh, beat you up on for sure, because you know, Mimi and Eric are tired of it. And um, you know, but I, I think your, your mentorship this podcast has been invaluable. I just want to open it up to the round table uh, people and just, and coaches and ask them, are there any other questions that uh, we didn't ask that you think we should have asked before we get to the tip of the week? Mimi's shaking your head. No, Scott, we're good. Uh, Eric, you see my name. You see my name. <laughs> it says he uses it. I can't read it. I can't read I can't, it. Yeah. It must yeah. be a Mac problem because you so you can't edit hey. this out. When hey, hey, Mark. You, yes. The one thing I was prepared for, nobody asked. Nobody asked me my, my favorite deal. Your favorite deal. What's your favorite deal? All right. So um, mine's a little bit different. I, I, I literally hit singles all day long. That's all I do is hit singles. Um, so I don't have one of these stories bought for five, sold for 50, anything like that. Um, my best Define deal for us, your, what's your single look like? Buy for 1800 sell for five. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's the Scott Todd model all day long. Yep. Um, so my best deal last year, last summer, I bought uh, 28 properties off a guy. I paid him $50,000. Um, and when I bought the, the 28 properties, the, literally the minute that I wired him the money, I thought to myself, I said, man, I just made, I just made over a hundred thousand dollars. The minute I wired in $50,000. And to me, that was a, that was a pretty pivotal point in the business because, you know, growing up and getting out of college, I always looked at, you know, Hey, when you hit six figures, that's really when you make it in life. And uh, I mean, looking back on it now, I, I, I have different views on that, but 
Um, that day when I generated over $100,000 worth of income um, really changed, changed the business for me. I sold all 28 of those properties within two months. And I think I profited somewhere around 115, 120,000. And I've since, I believe right now I've, I've paid back the, um, I've got my return back on the 50,000. And so the next hundred, whatever plus is, is profit from this point forward. Wow. So, that's, that's a nice deal. Even Eric Peterson yeah. would do that deal. Yeah. But, but again, it just, Easy, easy deals. Nothing, nothing crazy. Just, just singles, 28 of them. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Drew, thanks again. Congratulations again. It is so inspiring to hear, um, you know, the grit, the persistence, the execution and all with the toolkit. It's just four years of systematically chipping away at it and getting to that point of, in 25,000 a month passive, a $15 million net worth. That really is transformative. It is life-changing. It's the reason I wake up every morning and, and am so enthusiastic about this business and, and helping other people. So, you know, you are one of the other people in, in my life where I can look back professionally and say, I can die in peace uh, knowing that, you know, I made an impact and it was great. You know, we, we had, we shared two boot camps together, didn't we? Yep. Two in Orlando. Yeah. We, we, yeah in Orlando. So for, for you, uh, what was boot camp like at that point? Um, boot camp was great. Uh, the first boot camp really helped kind of solidify some things in the business for me. It was still fairly early on. Um, so I, I, I closed some gaps, obviously got to meet some people and that was great. Um, the second boot camp, I would say I was, probably a little bit more advanced. Um, so the true value out of the second boot camp were some of the relationships that I made and connections I made. And I think Scott Todd always says it, it literally only takes one little nugget at boot camp to make the whole trip worth it. And for me, it wasn't much of a trip because I'm local in Orlando, but literally both boot camps, there were little nuggets that came out of it that have made me hundreds of thousands of dollars because you know, with the amount of deals that, that we do in this business, one little nugget goes, goes really far. So um, I, I had a great experience. I think you need to come back to the, uh, I hear you're not coming to the East coast anymore. So you know, we come, we're in October, Atlanta, we're coming to uh, uh, Atlanta. Come, now, come back to Orlando next year. I, yeah. I can't, I can't make you East coast people happy, Drew. I just can't. <laughs> Let me tell you where he's coming. I know where, right where he's coming. It's the Tampa, Tampa, Tampa. I'll come to Tampa. I can come to Tampa. Tampa, Tampa seduced me. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Um, Everyone's coming to Florida. Place to be. Yeah, I still haven't had a piece of bread since Tampa, Scott. He's ruined me. That Cuban bread has ruined me. Nevertheless, I digress. Before we get to Drew's tip of the week, I do want to remind everybody, if you want to be like Drew, schedule a call. Learn more, go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training, find out which path is right, the toolkit or flight school. But I can tell you right now, just like Drew mentioned, if you want to really get there where Drew is a little faster or a lot faster, look into flight school. Again, go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Scott Todd will share with you the recipe, take you up that mountain of land investing quickly, safely, efficiently, and you don't have to uh, make all the mistakes that, you know, maybe Drew made or I made when we first started um, and just smart cut it. All right, Drew Kranovich, what is your tip of the week? A website, a resource, a book, something actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Sure. So I'll give you two uh, really quick and easy tips. Um, number one is maybe a different way to look at sales. Um, so when people think about, you know, if, if, you, if you're not selling enough property, a lot of times people think like, oh, I got to put out more ads and I got to be in more areas. And, and all of that's true. But um, when I'm not selling property fast enough, I look at my inventory. Okay. My sales are very tightly correlated with my inventory. The more inventory you have, 
the, the better chances you have of selling more properties. So there's a sweet spot for me. It's somewhere between 20 and 30 properties in inventory. Um, because if you think about it, you're going to draw people to your website that, that see one ad, but then they end up buying a, a, a different property or maybe they buy a couple of properties. So um, within reason, the more inventory you have, um, it's been my experience that, that sales will also increase um, accor accordingly. Um, similar to that is, um, I, I just call it the second sale. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've sold people a second property, um, you know, especially when, when, when you get buyers who want to buy for investments, you know, and anytime I get somebody who wants to buy for investment, I'll tell them, Hey, look, why don't you pick up another one? I got another one right across town. It's, it's a perfect investment as well. You buy both, I'll knock 10% off. Maybe I'll waive the doc fee. Maybe I'll make the, the offer irresistible for you. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gone back to, to previous buyers and sold them second and third and fourth properties. If I look at my year to date uh, sales, I bet 40, 50% of them came from previous buyers. So take advantage of previous buyers. Um, keep your inventory up if you can. It's really hard and really lonely trying to, trying to sell one property at a time, one or two at a time. So that's my tip. I, I love both those tips, actually. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal. So, dear listener, I want to thank you. And we really appreciate you supporting us. The best way to do it, though, is if you do us three little things. You got to subscribe. You got to rate. You got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit course as well as the latest wholetailing course, How to Double Your Money, 30 Days or Less. Drew Krianovich, again, thank you so much for spending the time sharing your wisdom. And um, again, I could not be happier for you. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Is everybody ready? Are we going to do this? One two three let, let freedom, freedom ring. ring yeah see the pc guy, guys were a little slow but the mac people <laughs> were right on that so yeah Drew, i forgot to ask you facebook or craigslist right now for you your marketing platform facebook i don't i don't do a whole lot on craigslist to be honest right now yeah i'm, I'm not i'm not shocked by that at all um, so it's weird times. I, I was going to say, who's going out to lunch? Who's bringing in lunch? Actually, it's, <laughs> it's, actually, it's, it's past lunchtime here or for, for most of you. Tate and I are like, it's lunchtime. Yeah, it's lunchtime, but we're staying put today. Staying put. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. May you live in interesting times for sure. But I'll tell you what, it's, it's got to feel good knowing that we can do this from anywhere in the world. Even if Mike Zano's on quote unquote vacation, he probably just want to change the scenery to work the land business. What do you think, Scott? Boston, Boston. or me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Scott, Todd, you ha you, we've, we've had enough of you and your, your PC talk. <laughs> Okay. Mike and I were just talking about that. Actually, I mean, he's it's a pretty cool situation. He's he's on the beach with his son, and he's taught his son the trade a little bit, and they're doing deals. It's pretty pretty amazing uh, lifestyle if you think about it. Uh, if you erase everything else that's going on, he's a little stressed about that being in Puerto Rico, but uh, but he's doing deals. It's pretty pretty cool. Yeah, it was great. You know, you know, what I've learned through this whole uh, this whole crisis that you can wash your hands in cold water and it's just as effective as washing your hands in hot water because it's really about those 20 seconds of rubbing your hands together that kills all the germs. It doesn't have, as long as it's clean water, it doesn't have to be cold or hot water. I had no idea. I've been using scalding hot water all these years for no reason. <laughs> Did you guys know that? Mimi, did you know that? I've learned that. I learned that the cells have a membrane that the soap deteriorates. 
So the temperature of the water doesn't matter. And I also learned that having the humidity level in your house helps. And that's why like the flu is seasonal. So, so is this coronavirus, it's seasonal. So places like Africa and South America where it's warmer and more humid aren't feeling the effects of coronavirus like we are where it's cold and dry. So the tip was to increase the humidity in your house. Oh, wow. Yeah. I got, I got phone soap online. It's like a little UV thing. You put your phone in or your Apple watch kills all the germs. 10 minutes. Cool. Wait. Yeah. Mimi, don't worry. Watch. I'm going to bottle up some humidity. I'm going to send it up to you. This is Florida humidity in here. Appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. My, my little gift. If I can help you, you let me know. So grateful. Yeah. Drew, have you seen any slowdown in sales since, uh, last few weeks? Uh, no, I mean, I sold three properties over the weekend. Um, it feels a little bit like some of my leads are slowing down a bit, but it's too early to tell. I, I literally sold property yesterday. So right now, no, but I think a slowdown is probably coming. Yeah. Mimi, you've, you've seen any impact yet? No, nope. no, Eric. About the same so far. Tate. Yeah, steady as she goes. Scott, you and I did a Facebook Live about that yesterday. Yes, we did. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I had two, yeah. two sales, two sales over the weekend. So, well, from Friday to Monday. So. Right, Scott Todd. Any anything you're seeing? No. Nope. How's exactly. land? How's uh, land moto traffic? I mean, land motor traffic is still solid and um, it's amazing because the, the Sunday deal of the week blast that we sent out, it literally had more clicks uh, on Sunday than prior, prior Sunday. So you would think that if the world was freezing up, people wouldn't be clicking on, uh, on links. In fact, I'll tell you what, man. I was just scanning the email before I got off here and I had somebody complaining to me uh, on the list telling me like, I don't know why you send this out when some of the people who advertise on your platform do not return emails. And I'm like, he's like, stop sending it if you're not going to re respond to me. And I'm like, well, what are you looking for? And he tells me what he's looking for. And guess what? Like if people aren't going to respond, I will respond and guess what? We'll sell them some stuff. So like, if you're listening to this and you're advertising, respond to the people, man, they want to buy stuff. It's the craziest thing I've ever heard. It's, that's, that's it happens, how, happens yeah. all the time, man. All like the time. It, I think people think they put their email in there and they don't remember. You contacted me once about a guy and there was no yeah, email from him. I think he thought he was contacting me. He did something wrong. Thank you for yeah, I think now's a good time to to do the the Drew approach and start emailing your list, get on the phone, calling your list. You know, they buy once, they're gonna buy again and again. You're a land you're a land investor, you're always a land investor. It's part of your DNA now. And now's the time to, you know, really sort of reestablish that that connection, those relationships and and you've got the time. Get on the phone. For sure. I, I would think. But, you know, the nice thing for Tate and Scott Bossman and Eric Peterson and I is that, you know, we have nice iPhones and and Macs and everything syncs up beautifully and just makes just things so so much more enjoyable, I think, working wise, as opposed to the cold, hard spreadsheet life of a PC user. <laughs> Look, I don't know what you're talking about because my, my life is synced up just fine. All my technology syncs up. I, I'll tell you what, man, life is great. Life is great with the surface. I took it out the other day. I went to the, went to the hangar. You know, that hangar that man gave, you know, like I went out there. Oh man. Took the portable lightweight surface plugged in, the plugged in the uh, old surface into the plane, downloaded my cool data, geeked out on the analytics of it. It's all good, man. It's all good, you know. I didn't have to 
carry this big heavy MacBook Pro thing. You'll get there. It's okay. Yeah, I mean, when it, you know what? When it comes to man caves, no one's competing with you, Scott Todd. I'll give you that. And by the way, I'll give you, I'll give you the bread, and I'll give you the man cave. But by, by the way, I went, I went to the um, Microsoft store here locally. They're open. I looked across the street, and Apple's closed. Like I don't know. I guess they're afraid yeah. of viruses. Oh boy! Yeah, yeah. and on that, on that, note, on that yeah. poorly worded joke. <laughs> See you guys. Wow. He's been waiting years for that one. <laughs> he really has. Thanks, Drew. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Rate and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.